This is the sixth Sunday of Easter. And the beautiful thing about our readings for this year is they've, they've come from the Gospel of John. And uh, it's amazing to see how this amazing story, the drama and implications of the resurrection of Jesus just unfold over these weeks. And I love the fact that we follow a lectionary through the Easter season. Next week is Ascension Sunday, and then May 19th is Pentecost, which comes early this year. And I want to read chapter 14, verse 23 through 31. This, again, is part of a conversation Jesus had uh, the night before he knew he was going to die. John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 take place before uh, his crucifixion. Jesus replied, this, he's with his disciples, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you'd be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Father, open your word to us as we prepare to receive you and as we prepare to celebrate your death and your life at your table. We offer this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the prevailing themes of these chapters 13 through 17 is this. Jesus is leaving. In fact, look at this. Here's all the scripture texts where he talks about leaving in those chapters. It's almost as if he wants us to get the idea that he's leaving. And as you can imagine, the, the fear that struck these guys uh, and we don't like anybody that we hold dear to leave. But he emphasized over and again to leave. Linda and I have a good friend. I'll call her Kay. Uh, we've known her and her husband and her family for years. And Kay was diagnosed with cancer uh, about five and a half years ago. And we watched her fight valiantly this disease. Uh, a young mom. Uh, their girls were young at the time. And we watched uh, as his last few months or her health began to deteriorate and it became evident that she was not going to survive. And uh, I was out of town. She passed away recently and I, I, I could only participate in the funeral through a video tribute to Kay. But uh, visiting her just a couple weeks before she died, um, she gave me written copies of her last thoughts, messages to her children, uh, her, the, how she wanted her funeral to be done, and um, actually an eloquent description of what a funeral is for. Uh, it was powerful. I still have it. But I watched this beautiful woman of God take the time. And one of the graces of knowing you're going to die is that you have time to communicate what you want to communicate. And that doesn't happen for everybody. It's an agonizing thing to be, uh, have a terminal illness, but one of the graces of God is it does give you time. And not everybody has that experience. But she did. And it was amazing to watch her unfold her heart, lifelong cultivation of love for Jesus that she was passing on to her children. And some of us have been a part of that. We've had loved ones that have, that have done that for us and with us. But this is different. Kay was uh, outlining a future for her daughters in which Kay knew and her daughters knew that she would not be a part of. Jesus is outlining a future for his disciples and for us that he was very much going to be a part of, even though he was leaving. And I would want to suggest to you there is no other incident like this in human history. That's what makes these words in John 13 through 17 even more remarkable, a future where he is going to be present. And this conversation in John 14 is really an answer to Judah's question in verse 22 when he said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? This was a private conversation with the, with the, the uh, 
the 12, now the 11. And Jesus responded to that question, anyone who loves me, anybody who loves me, that's a definition for what it means to be a Christian, wouldn't you say? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And John's gospel puts this formula together consistently, which I, I think we're in, always in danger of forgetting, that to believe in Jesus means to love him. Next slide, the next slide after that. To believe in Jesus equals to love him, which equals to obey his teaching. Do you see the formula? And John never separates those things. If you love Jesus, that means you believe in him. That means you obey his teaching. Now, you can obey him and not love him, but you cannot love him without obeying him. To be a Christian means to believe in Jesus, but it's more than cognitive mental assent. It is to love him and to love his word and his commands and to obey him. That's, in John's gospel, that's what it means to be a Christian. And we, we're, we uh, too easily forget that. And to obey it does not mean just to do it dutifully. And there are times in our lives or times in history where people obeyed an authority, but they didn't love them. But here, John means to obey, means to hold dear, to take to heart, to love his commands. And Jesus himself modeled this kind of posture before the Father when he said, this is, I do these things so the world may learn that I love the Father and I do exactly what the Father has commanded me. Jesus modeled that kind of loving obedience. It comes right out of the heart of David, Psalm 119, where David says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I rejoice in your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I rejoice in your word. When was the last time you rejoiced in the word of God? Or in Psalm 48, he says, I delight to do your will, O my God, your laws within my heart. I not only will obey you, but I love to obey you. Now, that's kind of new territory for some of us. I remember as a kid, my, the ground rules in our household was, and my dad's here, and he'll vouch for this, I could not go out and play until I did my Saturday morning chores. Anybody remember those days? And one of those wonderful chores was I had to clean the bathroom. I did it dutifully, but I cannot confess to my father that I did it joyfully. You who are, have kids still at home or you who remember having kids at home, wouldn't it have been something for your kids to show up at the foot of your bed first thing Saturday morning and say, Mom, Dad, give me something to do. <laughs> I love to do your will. We're just not wired for that. It takes the transforming power of the Holy Spirit for us to come to love the Lord, to love his word, and to love to do his will. I love to please him. And the older I get, the more I love his word. I love the clarity of it. I love the power of it. We went running yesterday. Whenever I jog, because, uh, first of all, I jog because it feels so good when I stop. <laughs> and I don't know if what I do qualifies as running anymore, but when I run, I, I, I recite scripture. Three miles of reciting scripture. It takes about four or five chapters of scripture. And I do that because it makes the time go quicker. It takes my mind off the pain. But I also do that because it brings clarity to my life. It sharpens my mind and my heart. It's like a cleansing. I'm not only burning calories, but I'm burning the, the dross out of my heart. I, I would recommend it to you. I love God's Word, and the more I, I, I hide it in my heart, the, the, how it fits together and the power and the profundity of it takes on greater dimension. Have you experienced that? How can you love Jesus' Word? How can you obey Him if you don't take time to feed on His Word? You can't. I love His Word in the world. I love the transforming power of the Gospel. Wherever the Gospel is taken root in the world, it changes things. It changes structures. It changes people. I love how it sets people free. I love Jesus. And I don't say it to you enough. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching, which assumes the fact that he will give his life to know, as Moses prayed, Oh, Lord, teach me your ways that I might find favor with you. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ doesn't mean to say, I believe in him and pray a prayer somewhere, some back then, and then you're saved. It means that you love him. And you want to 
align your life to do His will. Are you with me? If anyone loves me, he'll, he'll obey my teaching. And then comes the punchline, the powerful line. He says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, and my Father will love them. Anyone, he says, anyone. Then my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now, of course, God loves us before we, we loved him. He, you know, we love him because he first loved us. But when we respond in love to him, he pours out his love into our hearts. My father, look at that phrase. I, we don't have enough time to unpack that phrase. My father will love them, and then we, my father and I, will come to them. This is future. And we will make our home with them. The word home is we will make our dwelling with them. It's the same word you find in John 14 too. In my father's house there are many dwellings. As if I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And then here Jesus turns around and says, guess what? The dwelling is you and we're coming to live in you. And in the Gospel of John, that forms of that word happen 30 to 40 times. Uh, uh, the dwelling. And, and the word, find, you find it in John 15, the word abide. Remain in me. Dwell in me as I will dwell in you. And what it means is to stay put. It means to set up house. If anyone loves me, my Father will love him, and we ourselves will come and we will dwell in him. We'll stay put and make our dwelling with him. It is, it is a, f- a phenomenal picture of what the Christian life is about. And, and too many people still, uh, it's a caricature of the Christian life. If I do good enough, or if I believe in Jesus, then when I die, I'll go to heaven. That's a caricature of the, of the depth and the breadth of the true gospel. The gospel is... This is eternal life, John 17, 1, that they may know you intimately, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. The intimacy of the gospel. God for us in the fullness of time sent Jesus to be with us who died and rose from the dead in order that he might pour out the Spirit, God in us. And the gospel history is ever-increasing intimacy that you might know me and that I might know you. Our dwelling will be with him. Are you okay? You're awfully quiet today. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, remind you of everything I said to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit will communicate only what Christ has already said. Now, I think that explains our written word. Those who wrote the Gospels, it says the Holy Spirit spoke. And they recorded what Jesus had said. But it also applies to us who have the written word. But as you know, as we read the Bible, we need the Holy Spirit to make it come alive. He will remind you of everything I've said to you. The Holy Spirit will be with you. I will not leave you. And I'll make our dwelling to be with you. I love this uh, famous quote by C.S. Lewis, and it, it reads this way. He talked about uh, what it means to become a Christian. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house, and at first perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right. He's stopping the leaks in the roof and so on, and you knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably, and it does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? Anybody experience that? The explanation is this that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. He's throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor here, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought, you thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace because he intends to come and live in it himself. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. And the Holy Spirit comes, the counselor or the advocate, and that's a word that's hard to, to uh, translate. The paraclete is the Greek word. I think what it really means is a mother. It's a female word, one who comes alongside, one who never leaves, one who dwells in us and through us. It's an amazing promise. And then Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't be, let your hearts be fro- troubled. Don't be afraid. But the world must learn that I love the Father. I think what the disciples were asking in this night of fraught with fear and uncertainty, I think they were just asking, who's going to take care of us? 
For them, it was, a, it was a time issue, it was a timeline, it was a historical moment. Now for us in our life, every one of us goes through a moment where we seems like Jesus is left. Have you ever been there? Seems like he's absent. And we cry out to God, oh Lord, who will take care of us? In a Christian sensory article, James Somerville, he presented a unique illustration of the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. He said, when my wife puts her hand on the front door with her coat over her arm, my children look up from what they're doing to ask, Mama, who's going to take care of us? And then she'll give them the name of one of our regular babysitters. And all of our babysitters are capable, and my children enjoy the attention. But if my wife gives them the name Brittany, my kids jump up and down, and they leap up from what they're doing, and they rejoice because Brittany reads to them, she romps with them, she acts out plays and makes chocolate chip cookies. She nurtures their long, young lives like a loving parent, and as long as she's with them, they're not afraid. I don't know that the Holy Spirit has ever been compared to a babysitter, but if you can imagine Jesus as a mother, then it may not be so hard to imagine the Spirit in this other role as one who cares for us, the church, in the interim between Jesus' departure and his return as one who comforts, one who teaches, reminds us, and yes, sometimes even romps with the sons and the daughters of God. In the words of Jesus then, Rejoice. His absence from them has meant his presence with us. And when he said, you, if you knew I was going to the Father, you'd rejoice because the Father is greater than I, what Jesus was saying was he had a whole world in mind. And his absence from them, as painful as that moment was, means his presence with us.